G'day legends, welcome back to the Process of Success podcast. I'm here today with WA Young Gun batsman Josh Philippi. Josh, thanks very much for joining me. No worries, it's not, nice to be here. Excellent. Now, so um, just to get started, what, what I always sort of do with all of our guests is take them back to their first cricketing memories and how they got involved in the game. So how did cricket start for you? I think I've always had a bat and ball in hand growing up, um, just in the backyard, whether it was dad bowling at me, my sister, my grandparents. Um, so I think I always always had a bit of a love for it there, um, even going through Have A Go and that. So I always always knew it was what I wanted to do. And so you, did your dad play? Yeah, dad played. So dad played first grade for a few clubs um, in Perth. And yeah. um, I think he played a second limit game for WA as well. Right, so it's in the family? Yeah, it's definitely in the family. Mum was a cricketer too. She played for WA as well. Oh, there so you go. So it was meant to be. I didn't have much of a choice. There you go. And what was your first competitive cricket? So you did Milo have a go here in Perth and then what sort of how did it evolve from there? Um, probably just um, club um, club juniors for Warwick Greenwood just my local club team so I started playing that was obviously a little bit more serious um, and that was where my first sort of competitive stuff came in and then my district cricket started at Wanneroo. How old were you when you started at Warwick Greenwood? Uh, well I would have played have a go there so I would have been five or six. Yeah. And were you always a wicketkeeper batsman or were you sort of a fast bowl that turned into a batter or how did your, your sort of I think, skills progress? I think I tried absolutely everything. Um, Dad always wanted me to be a keeper because he thought, you know, that, that's a really good thing. Not many kids want to do it these days. So I always, always kept, but I used to bowl leg spin, off spin, seamers. So I wanted to do it, it all, all. But yeah. Um, yeah, I managed to end up going down the keeping path. At what age was that? When did you decide keeping is what you want to do and you sort of really enjoyed keeping and being heavily involved in the game? Uh, probably when district cricket started, um, that sort of became my spot in the team. So I, I decided to work a bit harder on it, and um, yeah, I, I started enjoying it a bit more. And um, and yeah, I thought that was that was going to get me selected in teams. And so when you you mentioned they're getting selected, so from a young age, and obviously your parents, good pedigree, played for WA. Did you think? I want to play a professional cricketer, this is something I want to do, or was it just about enjoying the game at that age? I think it was always something I wanted to do, like I, I love the game and, and I always used to used to talk it up when I was a youngster that I wanted to play for Australia, so it was, it was definitely a dream. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And then did you get any sort of private coaching or get a mentor from a young age or, um, or was it your dad that sort of had the biggest influence on you and, and when did you start getting some, some extra, extra help? Yeah, Dad, um, Dad's been a massive influence. He's thrown me balls since day dot. And, um, he still is heavily involved today. He doesn't throw me any balls anymore, but he, um, he's there for the mental side. Like We talk about the game, we, we analyse and, and we discuss that side. But I used to, when I was younger, I used to hit with Ian Kevin. He used to be um, Mike Hussey's coach. So I hit with him probably from the age of about 10 to about 13 or 14, and then, and then I just started working with Dad. Awesome, awesome. Must have been nice to be working with someone who was also coaching Mike Hussey or I just finished coaching Mike Hussey at that time. Yeah, absolutely. I managed to have a net session with him as well when I, when I was a youngster, so that was, um, that was amazing. Yeah, I loved awesome. it. Awesome. And now, when did stuff start with WA? There's obviously junior cricket from under 12s or under 13s. Were you always a, a sort of a whacker representative or did that happen later on? I was always in the programs. Uh, so I was in the talented athlete programs when I was... 13 or 14 probably and um, I was in the 15 squad I didn't make the 15s um, and I was in the, the 17 squad where I made it and I was in the 19 squad both years but I only made my second year um, I was quite a quite a small kid growing up so um, keeping was, was my opportunity there um, so yeah I, I definitely didn't play the way I do now with the bat um, but yeah, I was a part of it all, but I was um, definitely not as mature as all the other kids, so that, that held me back a little bit. Yeah, so you're obviously getting picked in the side now as for your batting. When did it really sort of cross over from being keeping number one, and that's what you picked in the junior representative stuff, to now you're, you're in the team as a batter? Yeah, I think um, my last year in England, when I was in Newcastle, I, um, I just, uh, I just um, yeah, I just whacked them everywhere. I don't, I don't know how to how to explain it, but I just made lots of runs and made you know, back to back hundreds and and even in the T twenties, I got a T twenty hundred. I got one hundred and sixty not out in the, in the cup final and and I think um, before that point, I wasn't really enjoying my cricket anymore. Um, I was left out of the academy um, at WA, so I was a bit um, a bit down. So I went over to England and I 
I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to have a good time, enjoy my cricket, play how I want to play, and um, and yeah, I just I was I was a lot more relaxed. I, I stopped getting really nervous before I batted, and, and I just really enjoyed myself. And I think at that point, I went like my my batting's um, yeah, like it's better than I, than I thought. Awesome. Um, and then yeah, and then I came back and I was involved in. Um, I got asked to come back early to play in the practice games for WA as as a keeper, but I thought, oh, like maybe they're saying I've made a few runs and you know I might be up the order a bit to get a chance there. And I was I was batting nine in the first game, and I went out and I I didn't get many and I can't remember how I got out, but I was pretty disappointed. And then in the second game, I, I think I was at nine again, and um, they ended up selling, sending uh, Mitch Marsh and Stornis out for their second hit before I got a bat. So at this point I was blown up, I was not happy. Um, and then I went out with about five overs to go and hit 20 odd off not many and hit a couple sixes and, and whacked some of the big dogs around. And um, JL sort of came up to me and, and was like, wow, like didn't realize, you know, you, you can bat. And I was like, Been yeah, here was, all the time. Oh, no, I, I don't know, I was, I was pretty pissed off, but yeah. I was like, yeah, that sort of um, led a bit of, um, negative energy out. Yeah, awesome. And it's amazing how well you can play when you just enjoy it and you stop putting yourself under pressure, isn't it? Like obviously being left out of the academy, you would have had a lot of frustration and disappointment, and all this emotion. And then just to go to England where nobody knows you and everything's sort of fresh and you can just go out and enjoy yourself, play with a bit of freedom. It's amazing what's what's possible, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's the biggest part of it. It's just relaxing and, and actually enjoying yourself because if you put too much pressure on it, it's no fun for anyone. And you know, you, you get too nervous and you're scared of getting out and, and you're going out to bat and you're terrified at the end of the day. So um, th there's nothing worse than that feeling. And, and I was sick of feeling that. So I think I just, I don't know what the turning point was, but I just decided I'm, I'm just gonna start enjoying myself and, and playing the brand of cricket I wanna play. Awesome, and it's, it's a great lesson for anyone listening to this or watching is just to to try and it's almost it's try and not care too much and just back your ability back your training back your preparation and just go out and have fun i'm a big believer in and i'm sort of coaching my players now very funny technique but just back with a smile on your face yeah. as the bowler runs in if you smile it sort of tells your brain you're happy and you're relaxed and you feel better yeah it's um it's the best way to play and rather than that tension that we constantly generally bat with yeah definitely i think um the biggest thing for me is the way I like to think about it is, is I like to play like I don't care, but obviously I, I really care, yeah. but I like to, to play with that approach because it, it takes away takes away all the nervousness and, and you know, you, you do all the work during the week, so you actually should be able to go out there and there'll, there'll obviously be some external pressure, but you just, just want to relax and enjoy it and, and give yourself the best chance to do well. Obviously, and it's just amazing what you did over in England. Obviously, a big turning point in your career. If you hadn't have gone to England, you said you weren't enjoying it, maybe you would have not even been playing cricket right now. So what? one of the great things I found in my time in England was how having a hit so often. You, can, you could probably have two or three hits, maybe more a week. What were the great things you found about playing over in England? Yeah, just all the different competitions. So we had league cricket on a Saturday, we had a 45 over comp on a Sunday and we'd have one or two T20s during the week. Um, so that was it's just playing lots and lots of cricket, which now we don't really get the opportunity to do here because we only play on Saturdays and, and there's, there's not as many T20s and stuff. So I think it was just playing lots of cricket and, and just getting, getting better from playing and, and making runs and learning how to make runs. And obviously, you were an overseas player. You, you, did you have to work when you were over there? Well, I, I had to work. I, I ended up being broke because they didn't find me a job both times I was over there. Right. So I kind of got mucked around a bit. But yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I, I, they ended up looking after me a, a little bit. But yeah. I was, I was, didn't have much money over there. I can yeah, tell right. you that. Because for me, when I was an overseas player, I, I really, I went over and I was getting paid a hundred or a couple of hundred pounds a week and. That was enough to live off and I think that sort of not having the pressure of going to work Monday to Friday and sort of being able to just to, to relax and, and sort of enjoy training and just really enjoy life and I'm a massive believer in if you're happy off the field it really comes on to your, your performances on the field and I found that that really helped me in my cricket when I was an overseas player. Did you find that as well? Yeah, definitely. Like I, was, I had a great time over there. I didn't want to come home. Yeah. So I was, yeah, I was loving it off the field and, and then yeah. I was performing on the field and, and therefore loving it on the field. And they go hand in hand often. You perform yeah. well, your life's good, life's good, you perform well. It's yeah. sort of, but if, I do believe if you can get your life sorted in, in a good place, it really helps you cricket. Um, 
So then coming back to to WA, you had that, you were brought back early as a, as a sort of a potential backup wicket keeper. Um, what happened next? You, JL sort of said, where's this come from? You, you hit a few of the big dogs around, they saw what you were capable yeah. of. How did it progress from there? I think they were all, all a bit surprised, um, which is understandable because I haven't, I haven't necessarily torn the world a lot in grade cricket or anything, or even even at the 19s carnivals and that. Like I, I did okay, but I never never really showed what I, what I thought I was always sort of capable of. Um, but yeah, I, after that, I was picked in the first Futures game as a opening batter, not even keeping. So I was I was pretty surprised by that. So they'd sent you from nine and not and pretty yeah. much batting eleven after Mitch and Stein came yeah. in again, straight up to the top. Yeah. So that was. Um, yeah, that was a surprise, but that was exciting at the same time. And um, the first Futures game was at, against Tassie at, at Lilac Hill, and I got 90-odd 90, 90 and 60. And pretty much from there, then the tour game against England came around, and uh, and I got 80 there, and uh, and yeah, I, I, that's played and it. And you up. opened against England as well, yeah. didn't you? But you'd not really opened before that, had you? I'd, I'd opened bits and pieces in junior cricket, um, but yeah, I mean, at that level, uh, with those sorts of um, you know bowlers and uh, and that sort of thing, I'd, I'd never really seen anything like it. So. And how did you approach that? If we go back to that first second level game, and we'll talk about the England tour match in a minute, but how did you approach that? Being sort of more of a middle order player who loves to play his shots, how did you then go up to the top? Because you, from memory, you still went about it your way, didn't you? You still attacked the game. Yeah, I wouldn't say I um, I changed my approach. I, I I think I scored at a runner ball both yeah. for for the ninety and the sixty. So I, I definitely played my shots. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I didn't really change at all. I, I knew I was in form. I knew I was hitting the ball well. So I think I was I was pretty relaxed and and I just let it happen. Which I think is a huge lesson for anyone listening or watching is. We sort of, no matter where in the order you bat, I think you've got to play your way. Like, I think too many players try and, and I see a lot of young players, they sort of get an opportunity to open and they think they have to be a different player. And I think you're a perfect example, David Warner as well, of like just backing your skills, backing your ability and playing your way, no matter what position you're batting. Because as an opener, you know, like there's more gaps. There's more yeah. opportunities to score. Yeah, definitely. There's... There's plenty of opportunities when when they have slips in place and um, you know no cover, no mid wicket. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's all within reason though. Like I've I've missed out last few Shield games probably because I I haven't been clear on how I wanted to play. Even though, like as I said before, I, I really was. I think when I went back up to the top, I I was kind of like, oh, I need to be an opening batter now, which was the possibly the worst thing I could have told myself because I just. I wouldn't say I went into my shell, but just, you know, I, I lost... Question some of your yeah, decisions, I some lost, of the instinctive decisions yeah. maybe you were questioning a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I lost all my rhythm, I felt, and um, I ended up trying to search for answers, which doesn't help either, because I don't think that was the issue. It, it was just my mindset. Yeah, and it, it is sort of something when you're scoring runs, you actually don't care because you've yeah. got the runs in the bank, but when you maybe get a few low scores, you start to chase things, and it's the, the real skill which I think the best players are capable of is just backing themselves no matter what, and they just really, whether they're scoring runs or not, they know that their method works, and they stick by their method. They tinker and they change little bits here and there, but they, they, they really stick by their method. And obviously, you're still so young, you've still got so much cricket ahead of you, you'll learn this and hopefully become one of the best players in the world, but that's something I really think the best players are able to do is just stick to their guns. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's that's what I I'm learning, and I, I think I have learned over the last few weeks since I've missed out. I've I've been dropped, and um, yeah, it's, it's just knowing what what you do well, and and just letting all that negative stuff go. And you know, like you miss out, everyone misses out. It's just accepting the fact that you, you're going to miss out at times, and you know, just just knowing what works for you and sticking to it and keep backing yourself in. Yeah, definitely. Now we might talk a bit more about where you're at now with the Shield side and stuff a little bit later, but going back to the England tour game, you're coming off runs in the second 11 game at the top of the order, you, you picked to play against England. What was the bowling attack that day? Um, Anderson, Broad, Wokes, um, Craig Overton, um, the leg spinner, uh, Mason Crane. Yeah. Um, so very, very experienced yeah, ball, with, yeah. with Broad and Anderson. The other guy's not so experienced, but with Broad and Anderson, incredibly experienced, incredibly um, amazing fast bowlers. 
how was Josh Phillippe feeling going into that game? Were you just excited to play? Were you scared? Were you nervous? Well, what were your thoughts? Were you sort of hoping to impress? What were you thinking that day? Yeah, I, th I think I was... Um, yeah, it's, it's a hard one because uh, there was a bit of nerves there, but I knew there was nothing to lose with a game like this. I mean, you know, I'd come off one good second 11 score. I was still... You know, a lot of people didn't think I deserved the opportunity to play against it, to play against England. So I kind of, kind of felt like, oh, well, this is just a great opportunity. There's nothing to lose, and I was just really looking forward to it. Awesome, awesome. And then you went out to to bat facing Broad and Anderson, and you just took the game on, didn't you? Eighty odd in the first session or something. Wasn't yeah, it? I just, uh, yeah, I just let it happen. Um, I think it was a, on my part. It was a bit disappointing. They took so slow to bowl their overs. They only bowled 25 overs in the first session. So often I, I don't start restart well after breaks. And I was 88 not out at um, at the lunch break. And um, yeah, I definitely just self imploded at that break. And the spinner came on first over after lunch, and I got stumped trying to hit him over cover into Gloucester Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only they bowled two extra uh, before lunch. I know. 100 in a session, and I know that there were headlines though. Um, I think I'd played against you before that, and, but hadn't seen much of you, didn't know much about you. You're a lot younger than I am, and then just sort of following that game, and it made international headlines. Mm. Teenagers smashes England around, and blah, blah blah. How did your life change after that, or what happened after that? You start to get a bit more recognition. What was next? Yeah, I mean that that was that was kind of. Just, um, yeah, that was an amazing feeling. I mean, I'd never had anything like it. I, my phone was absolutely blowing up. Um, yeah, I've, I've never been so popular in my life, to All be honest. All your mates in Newcastle and you, I know. you played your club cricket and the, must have loved it as yeah, well. Yeah, they were absolutely frothing it. So, yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was amazing. Like, as I said, it, I've never, never had anything like it and um, it's a really good feeling. Awesome. And now, finishing that innings, you score 88 in the session against a test team. Two things I think can come from that. A, you build your belief and you start thinking, gee, I'm good enough. I'm really good enough for any bowler, any level. And B, and sometimes they both happen, sometimes one or the other, but you get ahead of yourself and you think I'm the best player. Like no one, like no one's getting me out. And you go back to maybe go back to grade cricket on a, on a tricky wicket and you try and play sort of shots that aren't there and you sort of get ahead of yourself. How did you manage that? What happened for you? Yeah, I think that was a big challenge. Um, but yeah, I always try to stay quite level-headed. Um, I know that, you know, you sort of, well, you're only as good as your last game, but, but then again, like, it's completely different at, at all the different levels. And I know it all takes a, a different different approach as well. Like, like the wickets are never going to be as good at that great cricket. The bowlers don't come onto the bat as nice. So it's actually just as challenging in its own way, I think. So I always knew that whatever I'm playing, it's always going to be a challenge and I, and I like to try to stay level-headed and, and, um, and not sort of, you know, just think about, think about that sort of thing and just try to play my way in, in whatever I'm playing. And so staying level-headed, is that just about managing your self-talk and what you're sort of saying to yourself and what you're listening to a bit? Because obviously after that, people would have been saying, Josh, you're a legend, like that was amazing you're the next big thing, blah, 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 and sort of staying level, is it all about sort of like saying, yeah, thanks, but like, just got work to do and just focusing on what's next? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I had big aspirations the whole way and, and still at that point, I wasn't a warrior. Uh, I didn't have a big bash contract, so I, I knew that um, I still had a long way to go. I mean, that's just, at the end of the day, that's just one innings and, and if I, I didn't have a, a good year after that, I, I probably wouldn't be contracted. So I knew there was still a long way to go. Yeah, and then what what happened next? When did the when did the Warrior contract come? And then what were you then elevated to the Shield team soon after that, or what was the next little stage of your, your um, career? So the f the next stage, I actually got the I got a phone call saying I was going to be the rookie for the Scorchers last year. So I was pretty excited about that, and um, I ended up playing in a couple of those practice games against the England Lions and. Um, got, got a few in one of the games and, and JR pulled me in his office about two weeks before the first game or a week before the first Scorchers game and said, you're playing? And I was like, geez, I was like, I was shocked because you don't usually hear that so early, but he was like, I think he thought it, it would get me better prepared, but yeah. I'd have rather found out on the day because I think that, that just, 
uh, didn't necessarily do me, do me much good knowing a week before the first game I was I was going to play for the Scorchers at the SCG yeah. in front of who knows how many people and that was that was my first taste of you know a big crowd and and you know just TV game and it, it all that was that was the next step and that all sort of got to me and I I struggled I, I didn't do very well and I didn't get another opportunity for the rest of the big bash yeah it's amazing, like, I, I was fortunate enough in my Middlesex career to play a few games on TV and uh, a few games in front of a big crowd. It's amazing how the game of cricket doesn't change. You've still got 13 guys on the field, two umpires, two, obviously two batters, 11 fielders. You've still got a bat and a ball. But when you know that there's a big audience, when you know there's people in the stands and you know there's people watching, mentally it changes how we feel, doesn't it? How, how did... Mm. How did it change for you? Did you start to just put yourself under more pressure or did you worry about what could happen or what could go wrong or what yeah. happened for you? I think all of a sudden, like, there's all this external pressure that you've never felt before. I mean, being being the first game I've ever played in, in front of X amount of people, you know, you know it's a big TV game, you know, you know everyone's watching you, you know, um, I just think it, it's really hard to, to train for because it, it's just completely different feeling to anything else. It's, it's not. It's it's a different nerves to to your performance nerves and um, yeah. It's I, I really struggled with that and I'll I'll be interested to see how I go this year because I, I still think it's something completely different. But I think as well at that point I I knew I wasn't ready as well. I, I'd had you know one one that one good game against England and a couple scores in second eleven and. Um, you know that that was that's like the big league of domestic cricket now. So I, I I didn't feel very well prepared, and I didn't think I was ready as well, which definitely didn't help. Because mm. no matter how well you're doing in shield cricket, or even the Ryobi or the big bash is a different the kettle of fish. It's like packed out crowds, high energy, high atmosphere, big TV audiences, and you're really under the spotlight. And it's it's all about how you manage your mind and your emotions, isn't it? It's not about your physical skills you, you look after, but it's about how you manage your mind and emotions. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you if you come into that knowing you're ready as well, I think I think that helps. Um, but but yeah, it, it's a completely different kettle of fish, really. It's um, yeah, it's it's really hard to train for, really hard to prepare for. But I think it's just accepting the fact that there's going to be a lot of distractions. It's going to be noisy. You know, it, it's going to be a bit out of the ordinary compared to a normal game. And it, it's just acknowledging it, accepting it, and then just trying to go about your business as best as you can. Not be distracted by all those other things. Yeah. Now, you've just signed with the Sydney Sixers, awesome. Um, that'll be a great experience for you, go and spend some time in Sydney in the next few weeks. But how, how have you prepared yourself over the last 12 months? Just mentioned sort of just going about your business, but have you been doing any sort of visualization or sports site chats or anything like that to prepare yourself better for this 12 month, this sort of big bash 12 months later from last year? Yeah, I talk a lot to my sports psych, um, and he he's all about what I said before. Just just um, pr pretty much acknowledging all the destruction that's going to happen, that could happen, um, being prepared for how you might react in in all the different sort of facets. Whether whether you might be you know under aroused, over aroused, you might feel fine. Like it's just it's just acknowledging them and being prepared for all the different outcomes and. Um, you know, when when you do feel like that, it's it's not going. Oh, oh no, what do I do? Mm. You go. Oh well, I thought I was going to feel like this. So you can you can accept that and you can move on from there. So yeah. that's been a, a big help so far. Yeah, having the awareness of what you're feeling and then just going, okay, that's okay, and not getting frightened by it or worried about it. That's yeah. what I found when I was at Middlesex. Suddenly, a TV game. I got these emotions that I wasn't used to. I was like, oh, what do I do? How do I? How do I? And you sort of just understand it's okay. It's normal. You can still perform, take a few deep breaths, and that's what I now try and talk to my younger athletes about is when that day comes one day, you've got to sort of be preparing yourself. I'm trying to prepare them for many years leading up to when they're in the big bash or an ODI or a, or a test match or something. So um, last season, you sort of how did it all end up for you? You sort of had the, the good, some good periods, but how did the whole season end up for you and what, what did, then did your winter hold? Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, it was a pretty amazing year. I, I thought all round. Um, obviously, had had my lows, but had my highs as well. I mean, 88 against England. I, I played four Shield games. I, I got 74 on debut and got another 50 in my second game. Unfortunately, failed in my last last two games. But um, yeah, as I said before, that was that was because I started 
all those doubts came in and, and I wasn't quite sure how to deal with them properly. Um, but, but yeah, I was, I was pretty overall pretty happy with, with the year. I would have never expected to play Shield cricket, play a big bash game, make runs against England, even, even make as many runs as I did in second 11 cricket. So I think overall it was a, a good year um, and definitely one to try build on. So I got invited to the MPS and I got to work with um, Bucky Rogers, which um, yeah. is one of, he's a good, good, good bloke. Yeah, um, good mate of mine, Chris Bucky Rogers, former Aussie um, opening batsman, now a high performance coach at the National Performance Centre. Is that what it's, that's what it's called? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how was that sort of time in the winter working up in Brisbane with Buck? Yeah, Bucky was awesome. He's, um, he's very, very good mentally about the game and, and that's one of the biggest things I need to work on. And um, we had a lot of good chats about, about the mental side, about game awareness, about just being aware of the situation. And, um, and he's pretty good on the wanger too. He, he wanged me a lot of balls over the, over the winter as well. And um, yeah, he was, he was definitely very good for me. He rates himself on the wanger. He, he talks does. about how he, he never throws a ball that goes straight. He talks about how he makes them seam and swing and he's always trying to challenge a batter. Is that true? Yeah, he's, he's tough on the wanger. He, he gets a Duke's ball and he, and he bowls big outswingers and sets you up with an innie. So he, uh, <laughs> yeah, he definitely uh, likes to think he's a bit of a guru on that part. But what he'll never tell anyone is I actually beat him in the wanging competition. He just cheated and, and got over the line. So uh, we'll have to ask him about that. I think that. next time you have to ask him about that. But, definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah. Well, we'll have Buck on for an interview at some point. We'll ask him about that one. And he spoke to me at some point about how you and he and um, sports psychologist did some work up there. What was that sort of, that was around your mental routines and, and just getting a bit more clarity in between balls? Yeah, um, that, that was, um, we played a few practice games towards the end of, um, end of the program. We played one against WA and um, another one against Victoria, New South Wales. Um, and I, I opened the batting, I got 50 against WA, I got caught at deep mid wicket, slog, sweep, slog sweep and a spinner. Um, and then against the Vicks, I think I got out reverse sweep and a spinner. Just, just all at unnecessary points in time. I, I just wasn't aware of, of the situation of the game and it wasn't clear, clear on the fact that if I just knocked it round for another 10 overs, we would have, you know, cruised, cruised and um, yeah, we had an interesting chat with this, um, the psych from, from Cricket Australia and um, he um, came up with this analogy um, that it's like filling up a water tank batting. So um, first 10 overs being, being two fielders out, you can have the tap on quite high because um, you, you can take the game on, you can, you can try hit boundaries but as soon as the field spreads you need to change your approach otherwise the tank's going to overflow and, and you're going to yeah. Well, you're going to get out. Yeah. So um, the analogy for that was you, you turn the tap down and, and then you work ones and, and you go with that, that way about it. And then towards the back end of the innings again, where, you know, if the run rate's up or you're setting a total, you know, you can turn the tap back on to, to get back from there. So yeah. that was a interesting analogy that, that I think, I, I don't think about it all the time, but I, I think in the last few games I thought about it and it was quite an interesting way to think about things. Yeah, Buck actually told me about that. He didn't mention it was you, but he said he had a good chat with one of the young players and, and then we've actually spoken a fair bit. I'm writing an article on that water tank analogy at the moment because I think it's fascinating about turning the tap on and off and just picturing that as your, brain's re your brain is a resource and you've got to keep your resource full. So that's really interesting. So we'll have a, an article published on that very soon. Lovely. Um, and then, so you're back in Perth now. The season started really well. Um, 100 in your first Shield game. You did well in the Roby as well, or the JLT yeah. Cup, whatever it's called. Um, how, how was it coming back to Perth after spending time away from the squad in the winter and not being in England and all a bit different to previous years? Yeah, I mean, joining back up with the squad, uh, luckily all the blokes are very, um, very welcoming. I obviously knew them before, um, but that, they're all um, they're all really nice blokes, so I felt pretty comfortable um, sliding back into the squad. And um, yeah, I think I felt really prepared. I mean, having a winter training in Brisbane, uh, it's sunny every sunny every day. We train outdoors all winter, so I definitely had the edge over a lot of other players. I thought because being able to train on turf all winters, um, it's a massive privilege. So um, yeah, I felt pretty comfortable coming back in, and the one day it started up pretty much straight away, and it was was good to be put straight in the squad. Yeah, awesome. And so you you sort of um, started the season well. You got a hundred batting at number six, um, and then you got put to the top of the order. How did that 
sort of feel? How did you feel about going from number six where you'd done well to the top of the order? Was that just um, happy to do it, whatever the team needed, or were you a bit frustrated that you'd rather bat at six? Yeah, I didn't mind. I, I feel like with, with our squad, we've got a lot of blokes that can bat middle water, and, and their point was, you, you, you know, you've done well at opening before, so, so um, yeah, we, that's where we see the opportunity for you. Um, so initially, uh, I didn't mind. I was happy to do it, but I kind of, without, without um, thinking about it, I think sub, subconsciously I, I changed the way I, I go about it. Um, my, not necessarily my approach, but just the way I thought about opening the batting, I, I started thinking about it and thinking that, yeah, I need to do this, 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 and this, instead of just, just relaxing and letting it happen. Yeah. So I think that definitely, um, yeah, c contributed in it in the the poor performances in the last few few games and then by the time I was in Adelaide um the last game I played um I think by then I, I was I was almost lost uh, I didn't know how to approach it then and and um yeah it was um yeah it's it's not a great feeling really it's such a tough game because you can go from one high to like a low so quickly and obviously scoring 100 we caught up just after that, you, you were flying, things were going great, and then a couple of low scores, a good ball, a bad decision, maybe a run out, what a bad shot, whatever it is, all of a sudden your brain starts looking for answers, looking for maybe ways to change things, or looking for reasons, and all of a sudden maybe you start doubting yourself, and it's just such a tough game to stay on top of, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, as you said, I think as soon as you miss out a few times, you, you start searching for answers when you don't necessarily have to. Because uh, I think if you're pretty clear on, on how you play and how you want to go about it, um, you just need to stick to that even when you're performing poorly because cause you, you kind of know that formula works. But yeah, it's, it's really tough to do because as soon as you miss out, you know, everyone all of a sudden wants to tell you how to bat and tell you how to do it and tell you how to go about it and, and all that noise as well. It's, it's pretty hard to, to deal with as well. So. Yeah, people are always looking for a reason, aren't they? Or look like or something to to fix. Whereas, like I said before, I reckon the very best players, when they aren't scoring runs, they just trust their process so much that they just keep doing what they do. They just keep going, keep going. And I really try and teach my players, and I wish I knew this when I was younger, was that if you can not value the result too much, and you just say I'm just going to do my work, and the runs will come some days, and other days they won't and you don't get too high when they come and you don't get too low when they don't, that's when you get real consistency because you just really get deep in getting all your preparation and process right, trust it, trust your game, and then you just play with freedom. Play, but, and it's so much easier said than done. It's not, not easy to do, is it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we all deep down know that's, that's what you need to do. Um, but, but as I said... Um, as soon as things don't go well, I think it's a natural thing that we all do. You just start searching for answers and and sometimes you just can't help that. Mm, absolutely, um, absolutely. It's just finding ways to overcome that, yeah, isn't it? definitely. Um, now, uh, what what does the next sort of... You're going away with the Shield squad now. What does the next little period hold? You've got one more Shield game, then you're off to Sydney for the Big Bash? Yeah, um, so, yeah... I really hope I do get the opportunity to play in this Shield game, um, whether it's opening or, or batting middle water. Um, I feel like I, I got a couple runs last week in the second eleven, and I feel like I'm 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 back. I have the confidence back, and um, and uh, yeah, I know exactly how I want to approach it. Um, so I'd like to think I get the opportunity to play um, in Melbourne and. Hopefully get a few runs, and then straight after that, I'm actually not sure yet if I'm going straight from Melbourne to Sydney or going home first and going to Sydney. But I'm just really excited for the excited for the opportunity that holds. I think it, it's just a great opportunity to, um, to to showcase myself at that level to see if I can handle the pressure because I know I didn't very well last year, um, and, and yeah, just just be in a different environment and, and hopefully learn a few different things. Awesome, awesome, and that's the be best thing at your age is just to keep learning and keep trying to be better because the results look after themselves. You've got the ability. Um, now, going into your mindset and habits and routines a little bit, something I love to talk about, and everybody's different. Everybody's got a little bit of a different story or journey to talk about and, and things that they do. In between balls, something that I'm fascinated with, what do you 
do? Do you have a mental routine? Do you have a physical routine? Do you, you're not sure and your mind just switches off naturally? How do you deal with batting in between balls? Yeah, I definitely don't think my mind switches off naturally. It's something I've had to work on a lot. Um, but I feel like I'm getting better at it as, as I go along. Um, I'm definitely a fiddler. I fiddle with my pads and my shirt. And, and I, yeah, I, I do it a lot subconsciously, but I, but I know it's, um, it's just relaxing me and, and it, it's kind of just what I, what I sort of do now. But I, I kind of walk away and I, I don't like to think about the last ball because whatever happens, if you're still out there, it actually doesn't matter. Um, so I just fiddle around a bit and, and then... Um, so there's no analysis of the last ball at all, really? I think, I think it depends. Uh, yeah, I, I try not to really think about it unless, unless it's, it, you know, it, like runs in, he's buying out, he's all day, but I was an inning, it's oh, okay, yeah, he's got yeah, that. Got like, or, be aware of I, or I think I don't think about the analysis, but I think we all do it. Uh, like, I, I'll know, oh, I should have got forward to that or... Or you know maybe maybe I, I try to hit that one too square or a short little analysis if yeah, you need I, and then yeah on. yeah because I think you know if if you let one go I'll play a good defensive shot you know you, you know that anyway yeah. you don't need to tell yourself that or if you play a poor shot you you kind of know that and you and I the way I like to play I don't like to dwell on that sort of thing because because then you know you get the next half volley and you're worried about the last shot you played yeah. instead of worrying about you know nailing that one yeah. Um, but yeah, the, and then I, I keep it pretty simple. I just tell myself to watch the ball and, and kind of line myself back up in my stance. And and like I, my routine, I, like I just you know tap twice, hold, hold my bat up, and then I'll tap late and, and shuffle across the crease. And, and I feel like that that last tap really sets me, um, and and loads me up for the next ball. So when the ball is running in, anything you're saying to yourself, or you just just watch the ball, watch the ball, yeah. watch the I'm ball, just, and just sort of trusting yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I like to I like to think about it because because I should move around a bit. I, I like to say control my tempo a little bit as well, which yeah. is something I worked with Buck a lot over the um, over the winter. Because because sometimes I I tap it and it all gets a bit quick and it gets a bit rushed and 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 I find that my feet don't go as well. So I like to try keep that last tap and that that movement across the crease like really smooth and um and sort of short and sharp. Yeah, awesome. So, awesome. Um, and do you have any sort of strange or interesting habits or routines like or do you sort of morning of a game do you always do the same thing or do you sort of do you have any morning routines some people are sort of big on meditation and every morning go exercising going for a walk reading the paper like what sort of anything that you do particularly? um not not of, of the morning before or anything uh, like I, I'm pretty relaxed I kind of feel like if I have something to do in the morning and for for whatever reason something happens and I can't do it I'll just count myself out so I kind of um, I, I used to try to do everything like like this when I was a kid because I, I you know I really wanted it and but I, I've kind of kind of learnt that the best way to go about it is to be relaxed and you know if I if I want to go out and eat eat breakfast out and have a coffee and with a mate like I'll do that or if I you know I want the extra sleep in I'll do that um so I kind you need of, at the time yeah I kind of just just read my body and read how I'm feeling it and go about it that way but definitely the biggest thing for me which which I find if, if I don't do it I, I definitely count myself out like I have to chew gum when I bat I yep. have to like I remember I would have played you at Melville last year wasn't chewing gum, knew I was going to get out. What, did just you just knew. not have any that day? Just couldn't get No, nah, it was in my pocket. Oh. I just forgot and I was out there and I was going, oh God, <laughs> trouble. <laughs> but I just like, for whatever reason, I, I started doing it in England. And um, yeah, so, someone told me a while ago that, that it keeps you in the moment. So I like to think um, if things are getting tough or I'm getting challenged, I, I just think about chewing gum because I, I like, I, I don't like thinking too much. Yeah. Which is something Buck thinks I need to think more. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think it, I just Finding think the balance. Of yeah, I, I just think about chewing gum when when I feel like things are getting tough, and and then I clear my mind and yeah. and then go from there. Awesome, awesome. Now, you've touched on it a bit throughout this chat, but like you're a very attacking player by nature. You like to take the game on. You love playing the short ball. Um, how do you sort of? I suppose when you're at your best. You're just going with your instincts. You're just playing and you're just seeing it, and hitting it. And if it's a good ball, you might leave it or block it. If it's in your zone, you're smacking it. And maybe when you're not at your best, you're sort of doubting yourself and thinking, should I be or should I be leaving that ball and whatever. But 
how do you generally manage your attacking nature and, and sort of maybe being a bit more sensible? Yeah, I think when I'm playing well, I'm, I'm selective, but I'm still taking the game on. So, uh, you know, I might get a bounce, I might pull it, but then the next one I'll duck it. And, I, and I'm not thinking about, okay, like maybe let the first one go or, or, or maybe pull the first one and then let, let the second one go. I'm kind of just so in the, in the moment that they bump me, it happens, and I'm like, okay, yep. And then they do it again, and I might just sway out the way. And I'm not necessarily thinking about it, but I, I feel like when, when you're playing well, it, it just happens. But, yeah, as you said, um, when you're not going as well, like, because I know I'm an attacking player, I'm probably thinking about attacking too much. And then I remember the, the Shield game in Adelaide. I got a half tracker outside off and I try to cut it over extra cover and spooned it to mid off in the first over of the day. And I was, yeah, I just, I wasn't sure why. Cause I, I think if I was, if I was, you know, if I was in the zone playing well, I, I might've let it go it. or I might've crunched it yeah. or, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a big challenge for me cause I, I'm still learning and, um, I'm still making mistakes in grade cricket. Like I got caught at mid off again off a spinner this week for 60. So I'm um, I'm desperately trying, um, yeah. but but sometimes um, yeah that for whatever reason um, yeah it, it it gets the better of me. Yeah. Um, but I but I feel like the the way I play um, I'm going to get out ugly at times. So I, I kind of accept that a little bit. Yeah. But um, it's I definitely. It's a big thing I'm working on with shot selection and, and improving improving that sort of thing. But I feel like a big part of it as well is playing more and, and getting to more situations where where I am challenged and, and I do feel like, oh, maybe I should just jump down the wicket and hit this for six. Yeah. But then then being strong enough to tell myself, no, like, just see out this over or I'll just hit a one or yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, managing the self-talk while you're bad is, is such a skill in itself. But I think like you talking there reminds me of a lot of David Warner. Like he, I remember vividly how he nicked off in the first over of a test match, I think in Hobart against South Africa. Australia got sprayed everywhere because they were bowled out for no, not many. It was the last test of the series and Australia it was all in tatters. I think two tests later, um, Warner scores 100 before lunch against Pakistan and he's the best player in the world again. He did nothing differently, but instead of nicking that third ball, he crunched it through the covers for four. And it's just a very fine line, but he, he's willing, and obviously with you as well, you just mentioned that you've got to be willing to live by the sword, die by the sword, and sort of, you're going to play some amazing shots, you're going to play shots that other guys might leave or whatever, but you're also going to get out ugly at times, and if you can accept that, it helps you sort of back your own game a bit, I suppose. Yeah, definitely, and, and that just goes back to being clear with your game plan and clear with how you want to play. So uh, I think I've decided this is the way I want to play now, and... And I'm going to stick by that. I'm going to try to get as good as that as, as I can be. Um, and, and I feel like when I'm playing well, um, being s selected with my shots and my decision making all kind of looks after itself. It's just when I'm not going well, it, it's, just, it's just, no, just noticing those signs and just being aware of it. And, and then from there, you know, just, just accepting the fact that, you know, you don't have to look pretty all the time when you're batting and, and you, you can make some ugly runs and, you know, if you're not feeling it, you know, you can let more balls go. Like, it's, it's just accepting that, yeah, that just when you're out of form, you don't, you don't have to sort of play, you know, just try a tee off and, and, and think you can hit your way out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, final few questions. You've been very generous with your time today. What do you do now? Um, obviously, young guy. Um, got a professional contract. What do you do in your time off to switch off and get away from the game? Um, and is it something you sort of need to get better at, or is it something that you just really are good at and enjoy it? Um, I, like I, I don't do a huge amount. Like I, I go out and I catch up with all my mates that are that are just non non cricket mates because I you know I don't have to go there and talk about cricket and, and talk about batting and and how many runs I have or haven't made. Like so it, it's quite relaxed like that, and I can just you know be myself and and um, relax that way. Um, I, like, I like to go to the beach and, and chill out that way as well, but... You do need a bit of a tan, don't you? <sighs> yeah, I haven't actually been in a while, so... But, don't know about that. No, nah, it's, um, I just like to just get away, get away from, from that environment and, um, 
And, and yeah, that sort of thing, because I think the worst possible thing you could be doing is, is thinking cricket 24-7 and, and then you just burn yourself out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, what's the best way for anyone listening to sort of follow your journey or follow you and, and sort of potentially connect with you moving forward? What, what sort of social media handles, and we'll put it sort of, we'll put it in our comments, uh, description, show notes, but what, what's the best, what's your social media handle? Uh, probably probably Instagram's probably the best one. Um, I don't really understand how Twitter works. I'm still trying to work that out. Um, but yeah, I, I do post a little bit on on Instagram and um, that'd probably be the best way to, What's your to follow me. It's just Josh Philippi. Yep. Good luck spelling it. So. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll put a link in there anyway. Now, finally, um, have you done much, sort of we've spoken a bit about it, but have you ever done any meditation or affirmations or anything like that, any mental conditioning? Um, I haven't really, but I'm, I'm really interested in getting into some yoga, um, just just for that that sort of meditation side of it as well, and for the fact that I'm I'm pretty stiff and tight um, all the time. So yeah. um, a lot of people have told me that's probably really good for me. So hopefully, um, yeah, I'm looking maybe when I'm over in Sydney for that period, just just if there's somewhere nearby that I can do that once a week and. And I, I think it can only help me. I, I don't see how it can um, do me any harm. So I'm yeah. really interested in getting getting into that sort of thing. Yeah. And something I thought of before, but I've been meaning to ask is, where's you keeping at now? Are you still keeping a fair bit, practicing a fair bit, or is it just all all batting at the moment? Yeah, I'm um, I'm still keeping. I keep in grade cricket, um, and uh, yeah, I, I still um, do work at training and stuff. So it's it's there when I need it. Yeah. Um, I think more in the uh, like I kept in the second level game during the week. So um, I know WA know it's still there as well, and they're still giving me the opportunity when it's there. Yeah. So yeah, look, it's ready to go when required. Excellent, it's such a good thing to have a few skills to your bow. Um, now finally, I ask this to all of our guests, and take a second to think about it if you need to, but what's your definition of success? Oh God, put me on the spot here. Um, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, yeah, look, I, I don't know. I think it's, um, yeah, obviously performing well, enjoying yourself, um, you know, having a good time. Um, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. That's a great answer. Enjoying yourself and having a good time is success. Yeah. I, I would I would agree with that. Like for me, success is being fulfilled and, and happy with what you do. Yeah. So that's a great answer. Um, two more questions. Why do you play cricket? What's your driving force behind playing cricket? I just love the game. I, I love what it's all about. I always have as a kid, and, and it's an absolute pleasure to play it professionally. Yeah. And and it's 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 different because it's there's a lot more riding on it, I think. But I still love the game, and that's that's why I do it. Yeah. And one more question I've just thought of. This is normally our final. That was normally our final question. But how did your sort of approach to the game change when you became a professional so obviously before you were a pro you were sort of you did well against England and you were still on the cusp of being a pro but I know from my personal experience and I've spoken to a few other guys since then my, my, since my time with Middlesex but when you go from being just a second level player and just a squad member to actually being a pro things can change you can think differently you've suddenly got a contract to lose did anything change for you in that period of time? Not as of yet. I think I'm still I'm still keeping the relaxed relaxed approach. I, I like to keep. Obviously, you got to be a bit more professional off the field as well. So that's that's something um, I've been I've been trying to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, yeah, the biggest thing is is you got to enjoy it. So you don't want to be too worried about about the fact that you know you only have one or two years and, and that it might go. I, I just want to enjoy it while I can, do as well as I can while I can, and I feel like. The rest will look after itself. Yeah, awesome, very good. And last question, sitting down in 20 years from now, having a beer with your schoolmates or with your, your kids or whoever, what do you want to look back on and what do you hope to have achieved in cricket when you've retired? I just want to be able to look back and know that I've given it the best shot I can and know that that I've performed to the best of my ability because I believe that if I've done that and, and I've you know had a successful WA career, you know, I might be done in, in two years' time, who knows, or, or I might have played a, a, quite a few games for a Shea. I think if I look back and know I've done the best I can and, and given, it, given it my best crack and, and enjoyed myself, I think I'll be happy. 
Awesome. Well, guys, we're very lucky to have had such a great insight to young Josh, who no doubt has a huge career ahead of him. So, Josh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us on the no process worries. of success. And we, uh, we look forward to having the whole cricket mentoring community behind you moving forward. Cheers. Thank you.